What's up, everybody? Welcome to church. I'm so glad that you guys are here. Basically what we're doing, and this is a really kind of light, fun summer series, right? Um, just, we're talking about idolatry, right? Have, have you thought about that? Like in the summer, what we decide to do is to talk about idolatry, right? Everyday idolatry, right? Modern idolatry, right? Some of you are like, what in the world? This makes absolutely no sense to me. You, you have this idea of what idolatry is. However, what we're talking about is how it's so simple for us to take something. And honestly, that something is typically a good thing. How we take something and we place it in our lives as the ultimate thing. Right? We, we have this thing where we, there is a throne of our hearts and we have a tendency to put something on that throne. It's been said that we as human beings are idol making machines. It's what we do, right? It's how we were built. It's how we were, we were created. We were created to have something on the throne of our heart, right? And so what we do is we will find something else, typically something good, and we will place it in that ultimate seat the ultimate seat that's reserved for and only for God to bring the things that only he can bring into your life. We've we've read this verse from Exodus 20 before uh, a couple times over this series, but um, this is where God is just as clear as he could possibly be about idolatry. And this is the first of the 10 commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. And it's almost like he could hear everyone asking questions about that. Hey, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to have no other gods before you? So he he needed to clarify it a little bit. So his second commandment is clarifying the first commandment. If you've never thought about it that way, he says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. I mean, really, if we, we could have easily kind of flipped this series and called this series worship. Because really that's what this whole thing is about. This whole idea of everyday idolatry, this, this idea of counterfeit gods and us placing something in God's seat, really what it's all about, it's all about worship. That's what this whole thing is about. And I've said it and I'm gonna say it again because I want, I want you to grab hold of this, is that every single one of us worship something. Like it's what we were created to do. We're going to worship, whether you like it or not, whether you think about it or not, you are going to worship something because it's how you were built. It's how we were wired from day one was to worship. There was a guy, and you may be familiar with him. His name's David Foster Wallace. He's one of the great American novelists. Um, And several years ago, he was giving a commencement speech at Kenyon College. And he said this, this incredible quote, and I'm going to preface it by saying, number one, it's a long quote, so bear with me. Two, this man was not a believer. He was not a Christian. Um, So this was 18, 19 years ago, something like that when he said this, but I think it's so important to kind of wrap our heart around this topic of worship. He said, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe some choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, now listen to this, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is they're unconscious. They are default settings. In other words, we are going to do it whether we like it or not because we were wired and built to worship. The question is not if, 
The question is what? Like that's really what this whole thing is about is what do you worship? Because anything can become a counterfeit God. Anything can be placed on that spot. As a matter of fact, we can say it this way, that you and I are surrounded by gods. In Acts 17, Paul walks into the city of Athens and he notes, he marks, he says that this city is full of idols. And in this context, it was literal. There were literal statues and gods all through the city as he's walking through. He's saying, this city is full of gods. And I'm saying, looking at our world with this understanding, this biblical understanding of what modern idolatry is, I'm looking at our city and I'm saying, we are surrounded by gods. Right, it is full of gods. But even a step further than that, we could say the human heart is full of gods. Right, because anything could be bumped up to that space. Love, success, power, money, sex, right, comfort. Anything that we desire, our heart's desire could be placed in that seat, that ultimate seat of worship. And so what this series is all about is is kind of naming and identifying what those things are. Those destructive idols that we put on our heart and calling them out, dethroning them, demoting them and placing God where he belongs, right? The one true God, capital G God on the throne of our life. That's what this whole thing is about. So today, here's what I wanna dive into. Here's the topic that I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about. I wanna talk about when we make work an idol. When we make our work an idol. Now I know, the moment I say that, the moment I connect the word work and the word idol, most of us immediately go to an extreme of workaholic, right? Or we go to this extreme of uh, potentially this overambitious, greedy, you know, we'll kind of burn through anything, we'll burn through people, we'll do anything to achieve success and kind of the American dream. We kind of, we immediately kind of go there. But what I want you to realize is that that, of course, would be making work an idol, but that's an extreme case. For us to make an idol out of our work is way more common than you and I realize. It's way more common than we realize. So before we dive into kind of the negative side, let me just at the outset um, make this statement or, or just for clarity's sake, it surprises me how often this comes up or people ask this question, but I want you to understand that work right, work, the thing that you do, work, was created by God, okay? We have to understand that, that work was created by God. As a matter of fact, he spent the first six days of creation doing what? Working, right? And then one of the very first things that he handed humanity was work. So before the fall of man, there was work. I can't tell you how many people think that work itself was a consequence of the fall. It was not a consequence of the fall. Hard work, difficult work was a consequence of the fall, but work, purpose, a job, doing something on this earth was before the fall. It was what you and I were put in our hands to do. Okay, so we have to understand that. As a matter of fact, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 9, he said this, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. In other words, work hard. Work hard at what you do. And then Paul in Colossians 3, he said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. So before I even dive in any further into this topic, I want you to understand that God created work, therefore work is good. Y'all can say amen to that, right? That, like, like theologically, we just need to rest in that, that work is good. Okay, work is something we were called to do, we were created to do, however, As we've said, just like anything else, we can take a good thing and place it in the wrong seat, in the ultimate seat, and it becomes a bad thing, right? Why does it become a bad thing? Because it's keeping us from the best thing, right? It's keeping us from the ultimate thing. It's keeping us from putting God in that place in our life. Because what we do whenever we put something else in that place is we seek to attempt to get all meaning and purpose and worth out of that thing. A guy by the name of Gordon Dahl, 
said this. He's an economist. Um, and he's kind of looking at the, the landscape of America. And he said this, most Americans tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. As a result, their meanings and values are distorted. Their relationships disintegrate faster than they can keep them in repair. Because when things are out of order in our life and God isn't where God's supposed to be, nothing else works like it's supposed to work. There is a created order to things. And when you and I get them out of order, it all begins to fall apart. What happens is, is that we, so many of us, will take our work, the things that we do, and we ultimately worship it because what we're doing is we're trying to get meaning and significance from that thing, our identity from that thing. That thing ultimately defines us, and it's where we find worth. It's where we find our value because it's on the top seat of our life. Think about this, the very first time you meet someone, what's one of the first questions you ask them? What do you do? Do you know why you ask them that question? It's not because it's a great conversation starter. You ask them that question because deep within you is a belief that's been put in you that connects worth to work. So when you're asking someone that question, you're actually judging them you're placing a value on them because of the way you personally see work. Because you see worth and value in that. Another example would be this. If I were to just randomly throw out 10 professions, 10 occupations right now, you know what you would do subconsciously in your head? Rank them. <laughs> Think about it. If I were to just go down the list of high paying jobs to low paying jobs, what would you do? In your brain, you would naturally begin to group them by social status, by importance, by value. Why? Because it's what we do, right? We're Americans, we work hard, it's built in us. And so we have this belief system, this value system that what you do is the thing that brings worth to your life. What does that make it? An idol. It makes it an idol because you've placed it in the place that it's speaking worth into your life, but nothing can speak worth into your life but God Almighty, right? Nothing can speak value and identity in who you are, who you are created to be other than God Almighty. Nothing in this earth can do that but God. One more quote. I know I got a lot of quotes today. Just bear with me. One more quote. A guy by the name of David Zoll, he wrote this book called Seculosity, and he said this, work has always served as the great American barometer of worth and identity. Our occupation is the number one socially approved means of justifying our existence. And not just the type of occupation, but performance there. When we talk about success or failure in life, it's assumed that we are talking about work which means that a job is never just a job, but it's an identity. It's where we locate our enoughness and as such the stream from which our strictest pieties flow. Work has become something that we worship. And when we worship something, it affects us, it changes us. It's destructive. When you place anything in God's seat, it becomes destructive. A couple of the ways that we would know that we've placed work as an idol in our life and something, a few things that we see culturally is exhaustion. Think about just the, the, the drive to work that enough is never enough and there's this drive to work that is ultimately comes from this mismanagement of the throne in our life. We've placed the wrong thing on that throne. And so we're working, literally, you know, working our fingers to the bone, trying to achieve, trying to gain something, trying to get some worth out of this life, exhausted on the edge of burnout. Many of us experiencing burnout multiple times, being driven to the point of trying to get something that we can only get from God. And who ends up playing, paying the ultimate price in that scenario? Not just you, but the people closest to you, the ones that you love the most. Right, or fear. 
Fear is one of those things that really reveals that work has become an idol in our life when all we think about is the future and what if I lose my job and how am I gonna make ends meet and what if I don't add up and what if I'm not good enough and what if I don't have the worth? This what if, what if thing of fear of what if my job goes away. Do you know how many people when they lose a job go into an absolute existential crisis because a job was removed from them? What does that tell you? That tells you that, they are, that their worth and value is built on a job, not on being a child of God, right? So there's fear, there's exhaustion, there's also pride. I mean, how many, how many of us potentially, like the, the most important thing in our life is that title next to our name on our business card, if we still had business cards, Right, if that were still a thing. But you're right, that title, that occupation, that business you started, that thing that you do, that success that you've achieved, that is the thing that identifies you rather than being a child of God. Right, it's pride that's driving that. These are all just simple ways that we can go, okay, yeah, 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 work has become an idol in my life. And just like any other idol, when it's placed in God's place in your life, it becomes destructive. And so what I want to do over the next few minutes is I want to look at, I want to look at God's order of things. Because like I said, God created work. And if God created work, then he created a way that work is supposed to work. Right? He created an order. He created something for us to understand because it's a good thing. In other words, it's a good thing because it's supposed to be good for you and it's supposed to be good for the world around you. But for a lot of us, work is not often a good thing. As a matter of fact, whenever I said the word work 15 minutes ago, some of you went, ugh. <laughs> right? But that's not the way it's meant to be. There is an order to things the way God created it to be. You could even say um, there is a theology to work. And that's what I want to dive into, the way that we could rightly see work. So here's the first thing that I want you to see. I want you to see that your work is a calling, your work is a calling. This, you, you may feel like this is a little bit semantics, but I promise you it's not. There's deep and rich meaning in this word, vocation. Okay, the word vocation actually comes from the Latin to call. Vocare means to call, calling. In other words, to have a vocation, to have a calling means that there was something in you that you're built to do, wired to do, you have a unique gifting to do, and that is the thing that you are doing. You're investing, you're contributing your life to that thing. There's another word we often use that's career, right? Very similar in our context and how we would use it. Career is very much about me. Career is very much about what I can attain, what level I can rise to, the ambition that I have, the success that I can get. It's all about my career versus this idea of vocation, which is a very rich, it's a very old word that points to calling. So back in Genesis 1, we see where this comes from, this idea of calling. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in, in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Okay? This is where we see the beginning of this calling. But what I want you to see first if we'll go back to verse 27, what I want you to see here is that God created mankind in his own image. What I want you to see is that identity came before calling. Identity came before work. Identity came before what you do on this earth. Okay? He said the, uh, the image of God in Latin is the imago Dei, the image of God, every single human possesses and was created as an image bearer of God Almighty, okay? The Imago Dei, every single time I'm with my son, my son Max is seven, every time I'm with him, people will look at him and look at me and they'll say, he is a spitting image of you, okay? Happens all the time and he actually is, and I feel sorry for him, but he's cute. He is cute though. That doesn't mean I'm cute, but it does mean he's cute. 
But here's what I want you to understand. It's the same principle. There is an intimate and authentic similarity between you and your heavenly father. Okay, whenever I look at you, you are a spitting image of God Almighty. You are a spitting image of God Almighty. And that is it. That's where everything begins is at that place of identity. You are just like God. You were created like him with so much love and intention and authenticity. You were created to be like him. That's your identity. That's your worth. That's your value. That comes before any kind of calling, before any kind of work, before anything else. You were created to be like God. And then he called them. He called them first. There's two callings here. The first calling is that he has called you to steward the gifts and abilities that he's given you. He's called you to steward the gifts and abilities that he's given you. Look at verse 28, one more time. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in, in, in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God gave them work to do. He placed them in a garden in this place. And he said, listen, you've got a job to do. It's to be fruitful. It's to increase. It's to fill the earth. It's to subdue. This word subdue means to bring order to chaos. Listen, there is work to be done here because what I want you to do is I want you to take everything you're experiencing here and I want you to grow it. The beauty of this place, the harmony of this place, the goodness of this place, all the things that we're seeing and experiencing, your job, your calling, your vocation is to grow that, okay? But it goes beyond that because God would not say, hey, here's your calling without giving them the ability and the gifts to actually do the thing he's called them to do. So in this moment, whenever he gave them the kind of marching orders, the calling, he also gave them the unique giftings they needed to be able to be fruitful, to increase, to fill the earth, to subdue, to bring order to chaos. Like he gave them what they needed to be stewards over those gifts to do the very thing that he called them to do, to bring goodness, to bring glory, to bring beauty, to bring peace, to bring harmony to everything. And he said, and he, he gave them these gifts to be stewards over. You know what a steward is? A steward doesn't own. A steward receives. And then just like we see in Matthew 25, when Jesus tells the parable of the talents, we understand that when, whenever you're a steward of a talent, of a gift, of a unique ability, when God gives you something to steward, you don't hide it away. You don't treat it like it's your own. You don't pretend like it's your own. No, you steward it to make more of it. All right? You grow that thing. You, like there's something in you that because you love God, because your heart is torn toward God, it's growing and you wanna produce more of it, not hide it, not keep it for yourself, but you wanna create more. So God gave each and every one of us giftings, talents to do the very thing he's called us to do, right? To grow the beauty of, in this case, Eden. What we see here is the garden of Eden being grown and the beauty of God growing, so that's the first thing, that he's called us to steward um, the gifts and the, uh, and the talents. Here's the second thing, the second calling, is that he's called you to have dominion over whatever he's entrusted to you. So we talked about the, the fruitful and increase and fill and subdue and these things he's called us to do. And then the very next part of that verse, it says that he called us to rule over creation or in some translations, to have dominion over. All right, he has called us to have dominion over whatever he's entrusted us to do. Now I know that word dominion in our kind of current culture is not a word we like. Dominance, dominion, we're suspicious of authority. Like there's just, there's a whole lot of kind of connotation to that that just feels icky, okay? Just feels nasty, it feels terrible, it feels hard and difficult. But what I want you to do is I want you to kind of put yourself in Genesis 1, before sin entered the picture, put yourself in that place and then think through the context of what God means by giving them dominion, giving them authority, right? Everything we're seeing about this scene, this dominion is good and positive and wonderful, okay? There's nothing negative about dominion when it's done God's way, right? This is God honoring authority. This is dominion in a way that's going to bring God and his authority to earth. So what God is actually doing is he's saying, listen, you have dominion over this sphere. 
There's a, there is a place here. I've given you talents and gifts and I've given you an area of influence that you have dominion over, you have authority over. And what do you do in that area of dominion is that's where you can bring good. It's not an ugly word. It's meant for us as the children of God to whatever our sphere of influence, whatever dominion we've been given, right? To actually exercise those gifts and abilities to bring good into those places. Right? This is what we see in Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, it didn't last long, right? We, we know things went south really, really quick, right? Genesis 3, two chapters later, we see the fall of mankind, right? And we immediately see the consequences of the fall. Okay, we talked about this a moment ago, right? The consequences of the fall were that immediately in this beautiful garden, what happened? Thorns and thistles, the Bible says, began to emerge. In other words, ugly stuff. Right? All of a sudden, work became difficult. Tilling the ground, expanding the garden became hard work now. And you still have the same call. The call is to extend the beauty, to take the beauty of this place everywhere. But now it's going to be a little bit more difficult. It's going to require some sweat. Right? It's going to require something difficult. For the ladies, this is where the pain of childbirth came in. This is where we, when we began calling it labor. Right? It got hard. It got difficult. It got painful. Right? Not only that, but in that moment of the fall, the consequence of the fall was that they immediately knew that they were naked. They felt shame for the very first time. They were not fully and, 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 and in an authentic way connected to God as far as their identity goes. All of a sudden, there was shame that entered the picture. And not only that, but they, God had to kill one of the animals they had just named. Think about it. God had to kill one of their animals that they had just named to cover their shame, okay? All consequences of the fall, but none of that changed the calling. None of that changed the purpose. None of that changed what God put in humanity as the calling on their life to bring good into the world. So because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Even though at the fall, there was this great divide between this creation and God Almighty, the glory of God, there was this divide that happened because of the gospel. Now you and I can break through that. You and I can begin to bring the goodness and the glory of God into the world around us, exactly the same way Adam and Eve were called to do, right? Pockets of heaven, Right, bringing, reweaving the glory of God into our everyday life through the very things God put in your life to be able, the gifts, the, the unique abilities, all those things that God put in you, you're literally called to use those things to bring his beauty, his glory, his goodness to your sphere of influence, to your dominion, whatever that is, no matter how small and tiny or how massive you're called to use those things God put in you to bring the beauty and the glory of God to those places. The work that you're called to do, the thing that you do right now, the calling you have is to bring God's goodness into that place. And what's beautiful about that is God put in you what you need to be able to do that. It's there, it's in you. All you have to do is steward it. All you have to do is steward it. Your work is a calling. It, it, it kind of even changes the way you're, you're going to read this verse from Paul. You've heard this verse before hundreds of times potentially. But in that context, in that kind of lens, it's going to change it. Look at this, Ephesians 3, or Ephesians 2. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The good things he called you to do from the very beginning, extend God's glory to the entire earth. Extend God's goodness to the cubicle. Extend God's goodness to the job site. Extend God's glory into that coffee shop. Extend God's glory to the ball field. Extend God's glory to your dining room table. Like every place you're in, the good things that he planned for you to do a long time ago, listen, you're a masterpiece. You're created to do it. Steward those things well and realize that every single thing, every sphere of life that you step into, where you have authority, where God has given you some kind of authority, this is what you're meant to do to bring glory, to bring his goodness into that place. So number one, your work is a calling. 
No matter what you do, you're bringing order to chaos. You're producing something in that place. You're bringing, you're reweaving God's glory into that place. And here's the second one, and I'll close with this one. And you've heard me talk about this before, but your work is worship. Your work is worship. There's a Hebrew word that we've talked about before, but it's a really important word, and it's this word. It's avodah. Why don't you guys say that real quick? Say avodah. One more time, come on. I want you to hang on to this word. I want you to remember this word, okay? And you may remember it, I've talked about it before. It's such an important word. But in the Hebrew, it actually means both to work and to worship. It's interchangeable. Because in the way God intended work to be, it was always about glorifying him, okay? In the, in the creation story, there was never a separation between work for your glory and work for his glory. Never. It was always intended to, every single thing that you do on this earth to extend him, every single thing is all about his glory. So your work, the thing that you do to make a living, like every single thing about your life is actually worship or it should be worship. So instead of us placing work or this job, this identity, this career at the top spot in our life and worshiping it, it's that we actually realize through, through holy intention, through, through an understanding, through prayer, just understanding that everything I do is actually worship for him. It's all meant to glorify him and to lift him up. Every bit of it. Look at what Paul said. He said, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Every single thing that you do, right? Everything you do is for him, is for the name of Jesus Christ. And then one more verse from Paul in Romans 12. It says this, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, your ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Every single little bit about you. I love this verse and the way kind of Eugene Peterson paraphrases it. I love it because what it, what it really breaks down for us is that there are no compartments in our life. Like we're really bad about this. We're really bad about having kind of a, a Sunday compartment where that's kind of God's compartment. And then there's an every day, other day of the week or there's, a, there's this work compartment, there's this family compartment. But really when it comes to God, when it comes to worship, there are no compartments. Everything's a God compartment. Right? Everything in our life is meant to worship him. As a matter of fact, what makes your work sacred isn't what your work is. What makes your work sacred is why you do it. Think about it. Like you may look at what I do for a living. I stand up here and I preach God's word. You may look at what I do and go, man, that is sacred work. You know what makes this work sacred? It's not that I'm preaching from the Bible. What makes this work sacred is why I'm preaching from the Bible. It's to glorify God, right? So whatever your job is, and guess what? There are a lot of people that do what I do for a living that are not doing it in a sacred way because they're building a different kingdom, right? They're glorifying someone else, right? It's the purpose of your work that makes it sacred. So whatever your job is, Whatever you do nine to five, what makes that thing sacred is when you realize that that thing is meant to be something that gives God's glory, that gives God glory, that worships God, right? That's what makes it sacred. So every single part of our life can become worship because guess what? That's why we were created. We were created to worship God. We were created to be in a relationship with, with him. We were created to have him sitting on the top spot of our life to reorient our entire world around him, to gain our identity, our worth, our value from him. And then out of that, to go into the world and produce good, to bring his glory to every square inch of this earth, every single place. My challenge would be every single day, before you, maybe before you even open up your email, before you step into work mode, before you get on that first call, before you hit that first job site, whatever it is, that there's something in your heart, there's a, a holy intention that turns toward the Father. And no matter what your work is and, 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 and no matter what worth you put on your work, none of that matters. 
because your worth is in him. Your value is in him. And in that place, in that occupation, in that thing, it's actually a vocation. It's a calling. It's something that you're meant to do there. You're meant to bring God's glory into that place. And at the same time, every single thing that you do is worship, is lifting up God. So start every day with a holy intention. God, I'm turning, I'm reorienting my life. I'm putting you on the throne of my life and I'm turning it all toward you and you alone. Let's pray. God, I just thank you that you're here. I thank you, Lord, that today we celebrate dads. I thank you, God, that we celebrate you. But Lord, I thank you today, God, that you are here, that you're with us. And I believe you're speaking to us. And Lord, I, would, I, just, I believe right now that there are some in this room that maybe need to respond by just simply repenting. Maybe simply just calling this out. They realize maybe that they're gaining all of their worth and their value through their rise and fall at work, the successes and the failures and the mistakes and the ups and the downs. And Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us and that you would help us see who we are in God, who we are in you, our true identity, our true worth, our true enoughness, that we don't have to get or gain that from any outside thing that we can go to you and you alone. So Lord, I pray that today we would just come before you. We would repent. We would dethrone that God. And we would place you in your rightful place. Lord, I surrender it all to you today, God. We just give every bit of this to you. And I pray for blessings over every single person, every family, every dad. As we leave this place today, God, I just pray your blessings over them, God, that it would be an incredible rest of the day, an incredible week ahead, God, a week of purpose, a week of worship, a week, God, of just putting you where you belong and everything we do that it would glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're leaving this experience excited, inspired by what God is doing in your life. And look, maybe you're ready to take a step. It could look like a decision to follow Jesus or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life, or maybe it's just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to take that step right now. So look, there's a QR code coming up on your screen. Follow that link and let us connect with you. Because here's what we know, watching or, or consuming content by itself is never going to do it when it comes to finding the life that God has for you. So we'd love to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, but ultimately, let's grow together. Let's be a part of the church. And we can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope Church.